This program contains scenes that may concern some viewers. This land was promised to the Jewish nation by God. For more than 40 years, Israel has controlled the West Bank. But now there are serious claims that Palestinian children are being systematically targeted, arrested and jailed in the battle to control this disputed territory. And it's that fear and intimidation uh, that makes this system work so effectively well. You never know when there's going to be the bang on the door in the middle of the night. Let me say this very clearly. There is no such policy. A policy to create fear? There is no such thing. A new generation of hatred in the making. Welcome to Four Corners. Imagine in a major Australian city or in any other civilised society, regular late night raids on family homes by heavily armed soldiers to take away children in blindfolds and handcuffs for interrogation. Imagine a military prison where the inmates include children as young as 12 in shackles. Such is the distortion of life in a region of broken peace plans and deeply embedded hostilities between 2.5 million Palestinians and 350,000 Israeli settlers after more than 40 years of military occupation. A UNICEF report last year found that Palestinian children had been threatened under interrogation by Israeli security forces with death, physical violence, solitary confinement and sexual assault against themselves or a family member while demanding confessions for alleged offences, most commonly stone throwing. UNICEF estimates that over the past decade an average of 700 children a year have been detained, interrogated and processed through Israel's military court. In tonight's story, a joint investigation by Four Corners and the Australian newspaper outlines the way justice is practised with regard to the children of the West Bank. The reporter is the Australian's Middle East correspondent, John Lyons. A peaceful evening in a small Palestinian village. A 14-year-old boy and his family sleep. Suddenly, the night is shattered. The Israeli army is making a raid. Their target, the boy who they claim has thrown stones at them. His mother recalls that moment. Husay Zamara insists he's done nothing wrong, but this begins an 18-day nightmare. <laughs> At the age of 15, the life of this boy was also turned upside down. Fatima Fouz would spend the next 82 days in prison, beginning with an interrogation. Fatima 
صعقات كهربائية كان يضرب As a 14-year-old, Islam Dara Yub has also come up against Israel's security services. Oh, I tell you, خذ وقع هاي الوركة. حشت له ما هي بالعبرة وأنا بعرف شكر عبرة يعني إذا بتكرا لي إياها. حشالي هذا عشان بدي يتروح. لازم توقع عليها. فلما وقعت في المحيم بتفاجئ أنها هي هاي وركة الاعترافات. These boys are part of the new front line in the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. They're among the 700 Palestinian children brought each year before Israel's military court. You never know when there's going to be the bang on the door in the middle of the night and soldiers are going to demand that you bring out your children and one of them is taken away. Onto this front line has walked Australian lawyer Gerard Horton. He left his practice as a commercial law barrister in Sydney six years ago and is now leading a campaign to end a system under which Palestinian children have fewer rights than Israeli children, including being subjected to nighttime arrests by heavily armed soldiers. That has a paralyzing effect on whole communities. And is that fear and intimidation uh, that makes this system work so effectively well with relatively few soldiers on the ground. And so it also makes it quite a cost-effective occupation. Let me say this very clearly. There is no such policy. A policy to create fear, there is no such thing. The only policy is to maintain law and order. That's all. If there's no violence, there is no enforcement. The President of the United States But US President Barack Obama told Israelis last year that this problem will not resolve itself. And put yourself in their shoes. Look at the world through their eyes. It is not fair that a Palestinian child cannot grow up in a state of their own, living their entire lives with the presence of a foreign army that controls the movements, not just of those young people, but their parents, their grandparents, every single day. However, leaders of Israel's settler movement, like Daniela Weiss, do not agree. We came to a land where there were other people living. But this land was promised to the Jewish nation by God. All the other people who live here will accept Jewish sovereignty in the promised land. This is the only way I see it. So those who accept it, Live nicely. Those who do not accept it encounter confrontations. Those confrontations occur mostly near settlements. In 1967, Israel began occupying the West Bank, which is also known as the Palestinian territories. Since then, settlements, widely regarded as illegal under international law, have come to dominate the West Bank. Israel insists they are not illegal. So take a situation involving two children in the West Bank throwing stones, one a Palestinian child, one an Israeli child living in the settlements. The Palestinian child will be prosecuted in a military jurisdiction with far fewer rights and protections, whereas his Israeli counterpart living sometimes 500 metres away will be prosecuted in a juvenile justice system which meets international standards and complies um, is a sort of system you'd expect in any Western-style democracy. It is without question very problematic when you see that there are um, possibly very young children being arrested um, at, in the early hours of the morning. But there was a case... Lieutenant here. Colonel Maurice Hirsch is the Israeli army officer who oversees prosecutions at the military court. It's unfortunately an operational necessity um, 
because of the widespread widespread uh, disturbance of the peace that that occur when once we try to carry out the rest during the day and the reluctance of the of the, of the Palestinian population um, to to cooperate a priori with uh, the the law enforcement agency. To understand Israel's two different legal systems, it helps to come to Hebron, the largest Palestinian city in the West Bank. Here, 800 Israeli settlers live in the center of Hebron, surrounded by 180,000 Palestinians. This used to be a thriving Palestinian market. The effect of Israel's occupation is obvious. Now it's a ghost town. Israeli soldiers will not allow Palestinians to walk along these streets. Palestinians say they've been forced out and many buildings taken over by the settlers, protected by soldiers. This Palestinian man wants to walk along this street. I am from Hebron. I can or I cannot? You cannot. The first time I visit here, I can. No, you can't. Um, can, can I ask why, my... why can't the Palestinians walk this way? This is the order I got. Why, as a Palestinian, why can't you walk there? I asked him that I want to pass to go to the cemetery to visit my uh, father's grave. He said that uh, you cannot, you must. Uh, Just find it interesting that we as foreigners and I as an Australian can walk there that you two are Palestinians yes. in the largest Palestinian city in the West Bank and you cannot walk. When we visited Hebron, it was early morning. Many Palestinian children were walking to school. Suddenly, we heard tear gas being fired. The Israeli army told us it was in response to stone throwing. We couldn't confirm this, but we saw these Israeli police assembling. Then they fired tear gas towards the children. We saw no provocation from the children who were trying to avoid the gas. The teachers said tear gas was fired here almost every day. And why do you think the Israelis do it? They know uh, that uh, protect uh, their uh, settlements. But uh, we, we want to, uh, to study our children. In the last week, we take three to the hospitals uh, from the gas. How you? You speak English? We approached the police. We're from Australian television. We cannot talk with you. But can I, can I just ask one thing? Excuse me. We've just been standing here now. Why did you fire the tear gas towards those children going to school? We can't talk to you. We cannot talk to you. Thank you. No, but. They appear to be children going to school normally. Can I ask you why you fired this and the other tear gas at them? Hebron has long been a flashpoint. What occurs openly here, one law for Israelis, one for Palestinians, is typical of the West Bank, according to Yehuda Shaul, who served here as an Israeli army commander. The DNA of the military operations that we see in Hebron, we see all over the West Bank. Yehuda Shaul founded Breaking the Silence, 950 current and former Israeli combat soldiers trying to end human rights abuses. I've never broken into houses in the middle of the night here in Jerusalem and tear apart apartments. But in Hebron, where I served for 14 months, 24-7, that's what we've done. 
in order to make our presence felt. <laughs> Last July, one case shocked many. <laughs> On the streets of Hebron, five-year-old Wadia Maswade was picked up by soldiers. An Israeli settler had claimed that he had thrown a stone at him. His friend tried to help. the boy is taken by six soldiers. He was released after two hours. One settler making one allegation is able to activate this level of military intervention against a five-year-old. When his father intervenes, he is blindfolded. When you see an Israeli soldier in the street, what do you think? And what happened when they took you into the van? What happened then? Look, for my service, I actually don't remember children. Like, you know, I have some memories of Palestinian children when you burst into houses in the middle of the night and children start to cry or whatever. But these are the vague memories I have uh, from my service. Because just the idea that there is children and adults is not an idea that you have there. Okay, when you're in uniform, it's them and us. I want people to think what they would do if their five-year-old child was being taken by an occupier's army, even by your local police. Gabby Lasky is a prominent Israeli lawyer who defends Palestinians. If a five-year-old was being held by uh, an authority that is not you, you would do anything uh, in order to try to get your child back. Military courts are the long arm of occupation. We are not talking about courts of justice. We are talking about courts of occupation. Look. I grew up believing that our actions as a military in the occupied territories are here to protect Israel from terrorism. What I've learned from my three years of service and nine years of activism and breaking the silence, after reading testimonies of over 950 soldiers, is that the main story here is about maintaining our absolute military control over Palestinians. Palestinians say the soldiers are working in concert with the settlers. <laughs> this vision, shot by a Swedish documentary maker, shows settlers attacking Palestinian children while soldiers stand by. <laughs> And here, a settler fires live ammunition, hitting a Palestinian youth in the side of the head. Again, soldiers stand by. When we see settlers attacking a Palestinian, our orders are not to intervene.
Palestinian children face danger on two fronts. Night arrests from the army and violence from settlers. To get to school each day, these children need to walk past this settler outpost. Attacks from settlers have become so bad that the army escorts the children. But school has finished early and the army has not turned up. Today, the children are on their own. Their only protection is this Israeli volunteer who hopes by carrying a camera he will deter settlers. How do you feel though? You're a Jewish Israeli. How do you feel about this? I can't uh, describe this, uh, this uh, in words because I feel myself as, as a partly a Holocaust survivor because my, my grandfather was a Holocaust survivor. He was partisan. He, he, he ran away for a few years and, and all, all his family uh, died in the Holocaust. And, 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 and I, I don't get it how, how from uh, one who, who, who made, who, who was suffering from all those stuff, we, we became uh, people that, that are making other people suffering for our, uh, our behavior. It, it, it's, it's, it's break me. It's, 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 it's really break me. But the suffering is on both sides. Three-year-old Adele Biton has brain damage and may never recover. Eight months ago, I was driving back from my parents' home, back to my home in Yaquil, when Palestinian terrorists threw a large building stones on my car. The stones, the building stones, hit Adele's head and also caused me to bump into a truck. We fighting together to get her back to life. I, know, I don't think that it's fair for her to sleep here in the bed and don't do things like children in her age. It's not fair. When someone throws stones or blocks, building blocks, whether they're Palestinian or Jewish, do you think it should be the same law for both? For both, because we need to highlight the word stones kills. Stones kills. Her three-year-old child is basically, uh, uh, um, is still in hospital and it's unlikely that she will recover from that event. Um, that is terrorism. Lieutenant Colonel Maurice Hirsch says arrests have been made following the attack. We're now dealing with five miners um, who threw stones at some 20 odd cars on, on a fast road at night time. Um, they stood as a group at the side of the road um, and pounded the passing cars with, with, with stones. Um, they hit, a, they hit a, a, a number of cars on the way. If you throw a stone at a vehicle traveling at 70 kilometers an hour, that can kill. There's no question it can be very dangerous. And that's why I think it's so important to look at the evidence. The evidence collected by the Israeli organization Betzalem shows that since November 2000, four people have been killed in the West Bank uh, from people throwing stones at vehicles. One was a Palestinian, three were Israeli settlers, two of those were infants. While stone throwing can indeed be serious, critics say it's been used as a catch-all charge to arrest Palestinian children. When Kusai Zamara was woken by soldiers at 2am, he had no idea what was ahead of him. <laughs> He saw soldiers in, in his bedroom, which was a very frightening experience for him. One of the soldiers kicked him with his boot. He grabbed him from his T-shirt, pulled him out of bed, and dragged him outside. Um, <clears throat> Kosai watched his father totally helpless, his mother crying and shouting, unable to do anything, his younger siblings, his sisters, uh, totally devastated by, the, by what was going on. Kusai was taken by military vehicle to an interrogation center. Uh, 
مرضي يخليني لا استعمل حمام لا نام لا اكل ولا اشي ضل واقف ممنوع اتحرك كل ما اسوي اشي يضربني Because I wanted to know what the interrogator wanted him to confess to. And he said, uh, uh, I want you to confess to throwing stones. And he said, how do you expect me to confess to something I didn't do? And uh, then the interrogator got very upset and he actually uh, slapped him with, uh, with a piece of uh, a plastic hose that he, that he had and threatened to electrocute him. They <laughs> said, يضرب فيه قال لي يا بتعترف يا ما بننزل فيك ضرب ونجيب اهلك كان بنضربهم معك من كسرهم بننزل فيك انت ضل يشتمني Finally Kusai gave in فضل قريب ساعة ساعتين لغاية ما اعترفت قلت له اه ضربت فحنيت اخذوني قال لي طيب جاب اوراق دخلني عنده على مكتب طال اوراق وكتب على الكمبيوتر شوي طال اوراق اعطاني اياه قال لي وقع قلت له شو هذول؟ قال لي هذول اعترافاتك ابصر شو كتب بس هو كاتب عني اشياء ثانيه يعني كان كاتب اني ضرب مستوطنه وبنتها وشغلات هيك بتحس داخلك يعني لو الجندي بين ايديك بتخنقه بتموت After the arrests, children are brought to facilities such as this, which dot the West Bank and are used by the army and police to imprison and interrogate. Threats are often made at these centres. You'll be subjected to uh, violence if you don't confess. You'll be detained for an extended period of time if you don't confess. Um, again, the intelligence is usually very good, so the interrogator will know if that child's father has a work permit, for example, to work inside Israel. If that's the case, the threats sometimes are of the nature of we will revoke your father's work permit unless you confess. Could you show me what happened to you? When Fatih Mafouz was returning home, he came across confrontations between the army and youths. He says he was not involved but was taken away for 82 days. He was just 15. الحين يوم انا ما اعترفتش وداني على غرفه فيها زي صليب زي هذا الصليب وشبحني عليه الحين انا واقف على راس اصابعي ضليتني واقف ويعني الثقل كلياته على الكلبشات زي حدايد وعلى راس اصابعي مشبوح انا كنت ضل يضرب في interrogator started yelling at him and then what Fatty says is that he was then um, placed on some sort of wooden device on the wall, similar in shape to a cross, although it had two legs. He says that his legs were shackled to this um, wooden structure, um, his hands were shackled to the structure, and he was left there for several hours. <laughs> اللي هو بيصير يقول لي شو بدك بدكش تعترف؟ تقول له بعترفش على شيء عملته ما عملتوش يعني. اللي هو بيصير يقول لا انت عامل اشياء. يقول انا مش عامل وضل يضرب فيي. فاتي says after five hours he was taken down from the structure. الحين قعدت اتوجعها صار يطلع من فمي شيء زي رغوه بيضة اجوا اثنين حملوني قالوا له على الاسعاف. وصدري كمت علي وبطلت اعرف اتنفس. اخذني اخذوني في نفس يعني في نفس المنطقه اللي كنت انا فيها في نفس العماره كانت فيها هذا زي عياده هيك صغيره. فوتني يقول لي وين الوجع؟ يصير يعص عليه ويضرب عليه يصير يتخوث علي. From his experience interviewing hundreds of Palestinian children, Gerard Horton says one interrogator stands out. This particular interrogator specializes in threatening children um, with rape and he makes very specific allegations. He will name someone who apparently is waiting outside the interrogation room who will, um, if the child doesn't confess, will come in and rape that child. The Australian lawyer found one boy's testimony particularly disturbing. What he says happened is somebody then put some food, he thinks it was bread, on the top of his head, and then the dog was brought over 
and made to eat the food off his head. He was terrified by this experience. He could hear the dog next to him uh, drooling all over him. He was fearful that he was going to be bitten at any moment. Then uh, someone put food, um, he, w he was dressed, but someone put food uh, on his genitals and the dog was then made to eat the food off that part of his, his trousers. After interrogation, children are brought here for trial, Ofa military prison near Jerusalem. The army would not let Four Corners film inside. I've been behind these walls three times. I saw children shuffling across the courtyard, handcuffed and shackled. Some hearings lasted 60 seconds. I saw one boy shout the name of his prison so his mother would know where he was being held. I saw the judge convict some children without even once looking at them. Through it all, what I saw was a conveyor belt of convicted children. I think perhaps to give you some indication of how efficient from a military perspective this system is, according to the military court's own records, their annual, their annual report, the uh, courts have a conviction rate um, of around 99.74%. Typically, a Palestinian boy convicted of throwing stones will be sentenced to about three months imprisonment. The United Nations Children's Agency, UNICEF, last year released a scathing report on Israel's system. It found that Palestinian children had been threatened with death, physical violence, solitary confinement and sexual assault against themselves or a family member. The report found that that ill treatment was widespread, systematic and institutionalised throughout the system from the moment that the child was arrested right up until the sentencing process. Uh, the natural reaction is that this is an intolerable uh, these are intolerable cases and that I would like my authorities to do uh, their utmost to make sure that this will not uh, be repeated and uh, that this will change. And I believe that this is precisely what we are doing. Last month, under pressure from human rights groups, Israel stopped the long-standing practice of keeping children overnight in outdoor cages. Children had been kept freezing in the cages during snowstorms. While Israel appears to be making concessions, others argue this disguises a harsher reality. Four Corners has learnt that the Israeli security services now have a new strategy. They bring Palestinian children as young as 12 to massive interrogation facilities like this one. The security services are now targeting the children as a way of gathering intelligence on their villages, including asking the children about their neighbours and members of their own family. I can see a pattern that, um, that Israel hasn't been able to put down the nonviolent uh, movement in, in, in the occupied territories through uh, violent means. So the best way to do it is by incriminating those leaders. And the easiest way to do that, to, to achieve, to, to get those incriminations, is by arresting children, uh, which are the, the, the weakest link. So they're using children to gather intelligence? 100%. Islam Dar Ayyub was 14 when Israeli soldiers arrived at his house at 2 a.m. Islam's arrest was part of a practice by the Israeli army known as mapping. Palestinian children are now regularly woken up at night, photographed and questioned about which bed they sleep in. 
This video shows Islam on the right and his brother being photographed by Israeli soldiers after being woken up. What the army has done is that they have come to all the houses in the village and um, ask for the children in the house to show them where they sleep. They take pictures of the child, they ask for their ID numbers, and they map them. Three days after mapping this house, the army returns in a nighttime raid and arrests Islam. <laughs> Later, police come for Islam's nine-year-old brother, Karim. He was nine years old, I think, when he was first arrested, which is a completely... Um, unacceptable, even to the army authorities. Islam's interrogation was filmed. It quickly becomes clear that what the authorities really want is information about the leaders of the non-violent protest movement in the town, including Basim Tamimi. Enormous pressure can be applied during these interrogations. You tell the child, you can be released today if you just, from time to time, provide us with a little bit of information about who the troublemakers in the village are. Or um, sometimes there's offers of money, generally not a great deal of money, but the child can be offered money, mobile phone, um, threatened sometimes. They are trying to know information about the village and about the life of people, their families, their attitudes, the attitudes of the community and all of these. And the most vicious and the most horrible thing to push people to collaborate as collaborators with the occupiers to put them under the stick and carrot process. If you reject this, if you are refusing this, you will be punished, you will, you will stay longer in prison. So uh, this kind of uh, converting a child who is not responsible on his act uh, to be a collaborator is not just helping in information gathering for the Israelis. It's breaking this child forever. There has to be a pattern because the interrogators will want to gather information about possible violence emerging from a certain area or from certain people. And uh, I think that's perfectly legitimate to ask uh, people who were arrested for being involved in uh, violent actions, uh, to ask them where they come from, why they have been involved in such violent actions, who sent them, and whether there are more uh, people coming from the same place with the same intent. <laughs> Basem Tamimi rejects the violence supported by his cousin Ahlam Tamimi, who in 2001 masterminded a terror attack in Jerusalem. We reject all type of, uh, of terrorists around the world. We are against harming the human being life for any reason, but we are struggling for our right to live in peace and to build a state of peace for everyone and we uh, ask our enemy to remove the occupation. This is the Sumeria, this, and the we, we see here Malia Adumim. But this will never happen, according to Daniela Weiss, a founder of the settler movement. In the 1970s, Daniela Weiss would regularly meet Ariel Sharon, 
then Minister for Agriculture, to plan settlements so no Palestinian state could emerge. You and Ariel Sharon were determined there would not be a Palestinian state. With my many talks with Ariel Sharon and with my work with Ariel Sharon, there was a clear understanding, a very clear planning of spreading the, communi the Jewish communities in the way that there will be no option for a Palestinian state in Judea and Samaria. Despite international condemnation, settlement growth is surging. If a Palestinian child said to you, uh, what is the hope for me, for my future, to have my own state, what would you say to that child? This land was promised to the Jews by God, and uh, all of it. It's true that in the course of history, Arabs came to this uh, area from all over, but the promise of God is more important than the changes in history and the political changes. That is why you have to put it deep, deep into your mind that you, that you do not have any chance whatsoever in any point of history, neither you nor any of your offsprings, to ever have an independent state of your own here. For five-year-old Wadia Maswade and his friend Dia Kafishe, there seems little hope. Do you feel safe at, in your home, at, in bed at night? Do you want to stay living in Hebron? You want to leave? Where do you want to go to? In Jordan, in Amman. هم اللي بدهم بدهم الدور بدهم يطلعونا في صوبة مسخنة اللي أنتوا خمس سنين وبتطلعوا من الدور خلاص أنتوا مبيعات دوركو وما لكوش دور أنتوا. This is how these communities are torn apart in the middle of the night when no one is watching and uh, it is done one family at a time, one house at a time. And it's systematic and relentless. The system is devastating families. Sorry. <laughs> The boys are clearly traumatized. I think for anyone, when I got out of prison, I stopped to think about my friends. Because I love to be honest, that if they come back, they will take me to the grave. Messi, Messi, Ronaldo. Sometimes you feel that uh, these kids will be lost forever. So our work with them is to help these kids uh, get rid of the psychological impact which might destroy their lives. And this might lead them to whatever extreme you can imagine. This long conflict between Israelis and Palestinians is one of cycles and revenge. Today, Israel is strong. But what happens when this generation of Palestinian children comes of age? Israeli authorities have responded to some of the recommendations made in UNICEF's report, Children in Israeli Military Detention. They have agreed to pilot two areas in the West Bank where children are issued with summons rather than being arrested at home at night. 
To date, this pilot hasn't begun. Next week on Four Corners, inside the secret state of North Korea, with rare hidden camera footage providing further evidence of the abuses and hardship of life in the Hermit Kingdom. Until then, good night.